Welcome. I am a lay Shin Buddhist who nevertheless maintains an interest in the broader realm of Pure Land and Mahayana Buddhist teachings. My YouTube channel is called Akala Akala, that is A-C-A-L-A-A-C-A-L-A. -A 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 -A. In these podcasts, I make a non-scholarly, humble, and sometimes bumbling attempt to explore a particular topic or question related to the wonderful Buddha Dharma. I hope you find them to be of interest. With that said, let us begin. So, I may or may not have mentioned that in the recent past, in order to basically give support and encouragement to my significant other in meeting her own spiritual needs, which are Christian-oriented, I've been attending with her a Methodist church here in my local community. This is a community in the Bible Belt, so to speak, in, in the southeastern United States, where basically Christianity is quite dominant, as it is generally in the United States of America. And as I listen to sermons there, and as I reflect upon the, the doctrines of Christianity, I note in my own mind several differences between Christianity and Buddhism in terms particularly of our Pure Land sect as far as attributes of Amida Buddha which he does not claim. In other words, what I want to focus on in this podcast are, as the title indicates, things that Amida is not, and see if this makes sense to you as listeners who follow the Pure Land way. First, Amida Buddha does not claim to be a creator. He did not create the world, he did not create sentient beings. His basic function, as far as I'm concerned, is to save us through the power of his primal vow, us having existed here as a result of causes and conditions of a, of a mysterious and unknown nature. In fact, the phrase that I like within Buddhism is the beginningless past. This was, I think, one of the questions probably that Sakyamuni Buddha refused to answer when he was asked about the origin of human beings and sentient beings generally. Sakyamuni's interest and motivation was to help us gain relief from our suffering. Again, there were several questions that he basically refused to answer. We cannot know what the basis was for our ultimate creation. We're learning a lot more in science, you know, tying back to the Big Bang, or at least what happened one second after the Big Bang, even though we can't fathom what happened before. So, in any case, Amida doesn't try to answer this question, and nor does he take credit for our creation or existence or being in this world. Maybe partly because of that, Amida also does not claim kingship. He does not claim to be a king. He does not claim to need us to follow him in the same way as subjects in a monarchy follow their king or queen. We do not really owe him anything by way of allegiance or belief. In fact, the Shinjin that is the basis for our faith, so-called, in Amida Buddha and in the power of his vow, is endowed to us by Amida. It's him giving us the gift, not expecting something of us in return. I actually wrote a paper one time in terms of what Amida expects of me, and the bottom line is really he expects nothing, but that I expect things of myself. In other words, I expect myself to live a moral, ethical life, in spite of the fact that any evil that I may commit, any anger or aversion or lust or greed or ignorance that may manifest itself in this physical body and mind that I'm that I'm burdened with, so to speak. These are not things that Amita holds against me. These are things that I should try to remedy and improve over the course of time in order to be a more ethical and humanistic kind of sentient being within this world that I'm living on. But again, this is not related to Amita's expectations or demands. Third is that I don't believe that Amida Buddha is omnipotent. I don't believe that he has power to determine outcomes in our life. He can't sort of reach down and cure an illness or stop a war or, for that matter, do anything to guarantee that we will have peace of mind. 
What he does do, though, is he provides us reassurance that we can be reborn in his pure land of bliss, and that does create a certain peace of mind to the extent that it helps us resolve the question of our fate subsequent to our demise, subsequent to our death of this body. And then finally, and what's most important, is that Amida Buddha does not claim that he, in that form, as a cosmic Buddha, is the only form that can assist sentient beings toward their salvation. This then ties back again to the Lotus Sutra and the chapter on skillful means, chapter 2 of the Lotus Sutra, where the Buddha teaches that the method of the Buddha, and in this sense we can think more broadly of what is the method of the divine, if there is a divine reality that transcends this mundane earthly life, you know, what is the motivation and methodology of that divine reality in helping helping human beings with our various anxieties, particularly as regards death? Well, again, what's taught in the Lotus Sutra is that the Buddha, or the divine, uses skillful means. He, or she, basically presents himself, herself, in forms that we can relate to as a function of our particular psychology, how we operate, what culture we live in, etc. So, you know, <laughs> the divine doesn't manifest itself in the form of a Buddha if basically we're talking about beings that live in a culture that has never encountered the religion of Buddhism. There are many religions in the world, and some of them are what we can call universal religions, religions of salvation, and each of them, in, in a sense, has its own salvation story. Now, there are some perhaps that are more effective or better than others in certain ways, particularly in terms of what outcomes they lead to with respect to human suffering and compatibilities with science and, and other aspects of human knowledge. But it's clear to me that the divine can appear in many forms. Take, for example, the 25th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, about Kuan Yin or Avalokiteshvara, the regarder of the cries of the world. There we have within Buddhism an explicit doctrine saying that this embodiment of compassion can manifest himself slash herself in various forms as a function of what our needs are in order to provide us with support and assistance. So again, Amida doesn't consider himself to be the exclusive only path to salvation. But he is a Buddha who has provided us with a path on the basis of Dharmakara's primal vow, his 18th vow, and that to the extent that we can believe in this vow and in its power, that entrusting, which again is a manifestation of Amida's gift to us, is a basis for us to feel assured that we will be reborn in his land of bliss when we die. We will then become a Buddha, fully enlightened and able to manifest ourselves in various transformational forms in order to help other sentient beings to gain likewise that wonderful state of full enlightenment. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Namo Mirabhuts. With that, I will sign off by reciting the Nembutsu in gratitude for being embraced and accepted just as I am by Amida Buddha. Never never to be abandoned. Namo Mira Boots. Namo Mira Boots. Namo Mira Boots.